start and uh, I will have the interesting uh, bits to this uh, to other gentlemen. Uh, okay, so we are the Kirin main uh, team and uh, well, the, uh, what, what do we do? We, we manage the Kirings. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> So well, uh, we are hello. We are the keyring maintaining uh, team. What, what we do is uh, we maintain the keyrings that uh, define who is part of uh, what part of Debian or who is in which. I don't like saying category, but uh, well, it's the right word. Uh, and uh, well, the keyring is formed from these uh, six files or directories, depending how you look at them. The naming is suboptimal because it's m mostly historic. So when I joined uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, who has been a uh, longer time uh, maintainer, uh, uh, well, uh, Keyring maintainer, uh, we only had the Debian Keyring and the not used ones. Uh, nowadays, Debian Keyring means Debian developer, Debian maintainers means uh, who is a uh, maintainer, Debian non-upload are non-uploading developers. And the other three are kept, uh, well, Debian role keys is something that I guess is not used for basically anything. Most, most of the role keys have moved to uh, more specific packages. So previously that would have had things like um, the archive key, which has moved to its own package. Um, there are a few other ones like that, which are actually maintained by their own teams. So we don't actually look after those anymore, but they're just around for historic reasons. Yep. And we have, well, those keys that are explicitly kept for history those the, the emeritus and removed keys, but, uh, but are no, uh, no longer used. Uh, we don't uh, see here, well, we do have, and uh, I made a late, little mistake, we have emeritus curing PGP and, uh, and GPG, well, because uh, of some of the migration history we will uh, uh, explain now. No? So well, this is uh, like an overview of, of uh, how uh, the number of Debian keys we are uh, we're, uh, currently handling. We have again passed the 990, or just about uh, 1,000 uh, uh, developers with developer keys. We are at well, uh, I'll show the numbers just next uh, uh, somewhere around here. But we are close to 270 maintainers and about 10 non-uploaders. Uh, I mean, this is just over time. Uh, uh, our history just goes back to 2008, because be before that uh, it was not uh, uh, maintained in uh, a, a version control system. So we have the history, but it's up to you to mine the data. Um, OK, uh, I think. So um, one of the concerns recently that I'm sure people have heard about, and not so recently, uh, is that we're trying to make sure that the Debian key ring does not contain uh, cryptographically weak um, or, or uh, weak for protocols uh, keys that could actually affect the contents of the archive. So uh, in particular, um, there have been a couple of successful moves, and uh, some that have not yet been successful but will be soon. Um, so. Uh, one of them was that open, so PGP keys are a certificate that wraps up a, um, a public, public key material. But there are different formats of PGP certificates. There's PGP v3 and PGP v4. And everyone should be using PGP v4. And in fact, everyone in Debian is now using um, PGP v4 because we wanted to get rid of uh, PGP v3. Um, I can talk a bit about why uh, PGP v3 is a terrible format. But the simplest answer is it's trivial to forge a fingerprint for a PGP v3 certificate. Trivial. So, um, so those are going away. Um, th those went away. Uh, and the, the final, I think, little bump down there is, um, yeah, is a, a nice triage that just finally said, OK, it, it, it's too late. Where it, where it says GPG there, that should say PGP v4. Yeah, sorry. So that's OK. Um, so people got the message, they started moving away, some of them never made it, and then there was this nice bump of actually just kicking out 17 keys that people had just couldn't be bothered to swap out for v4. One, one more. So, um, so the other thing that, that we're interested in is um, the strength of the key. So cryptographic keys have a key length, uh, different algorithms, the key lengths mean different things. And I just wanted to give a brief background for why we are trying to get rid of uh, shorter keys. And so this is a, this is a table from 
uh, from eCrypt, which is a European crypto uh, cryptography report from 2012, so two years old now. Um, and it's a description, I don't know if you can read this on the slides here, but basically it describes different types of key, of key these are different key types here, RSA, D-log is like DSA, um, and EC is elliptic curve. And for keys of these lengths, um, so this is the DSA uh, size and the RSA <laughs> size, you'll see that those are paired up. You measure, you measure the strength of a key in uh, sort of equivalent bits of symmetric security. And there's a little number there. And th so what this means is that an attacker would need to do, say, two to the 80th operations to crack a uh, 1,248-bit um, uh, DSA key. So that's th this is rough, right? All of these estimations are very rough. There's a bunch of different details about how an attack like that would go. And here they've got common key sizes. They show that a 1024-bit DSA key or uh, RSA key is about 73 bits of security. So what is 73 bits of security? Can you go back one? Um, so this is the, the same report. You're what, you can go and find this. I can point you to the eCrypt slides. It says, so this is a table that just shows uh, some bits of symmetric security and then there's a description and there's a comment um, and so 73 well 72 is the closest here it says short-term protection against medium organizations medium-term protection against small organizations and there's no comment 96 legacy standard level roughly 10 years protection so 1024 bit keys are way too short for something as important as the ability to upload into the Debian archive. We've been trying to get people off of 1024-bit keys for a long time, and uh, we haven't done it yet, but we plan to. So, two forward, please. If you weren't convinced that you should move away from it, the uh, Certificate Authority Cartel, via the CA browser forum, made th they have a baseline requirements, um, which they publish an update. This is uh, the update from earlier this year, V118, um, you cannot issue, if you're a member of the, of the Certificate Authority Cartel, you cannot issue an end entity certificate with 1024-bit, um, with, with anything less than 24-bit RSA um, as of the end of last year. So we are behind what the Certificate Authority Cartel is requiring for end entity certificates for mycrappywebsite.com. <laughs> So, okay, so this is a breakdown um, of the different keys, uh, different key sizes. These are non-uploaders. You can see that the non-uploaders are quite good at having strong keys. No 1024-bit RSA keys or, D, uh, or DSA keys. The next. Yeah. Um, and the Debian maintainers are also quite good. The, um, we still have a few 1024-bits in there. That's uh, 50 or so. But on balance, they're, they're much stronger. I want to point out something here that, well, um, the, both the maintainers and non-uploaders have uh, reacted quicker because, well, they're newer figures, so we were, uh, we were able to, uh, to require this earlier on. But you see there is this, this flattening thread, uh, trend, sorry, flattening trend. So uh, I think this, uh, it, it, it can be harder to... <laughs> To, to get the, to those uh, last uh, 50 if we don't uh, act quickly on it. The, the other thing that's worth... Sorry, yellow is 1024 bit, purple is 4096. And green, <laughs> green is 2048. Yeah, yeah, so just to actually back up a bit, um, our, our current recommendation is that people use 4K keys. We have allowed 2048 keys into the um, key ring. Um, so in general, people are going with the recommendation. There have been some reasonable reasons to use a shorter key length. Um, in particular, the OpenPGP smart cards were originally limited into the, the key length they could support. Um, anyone who doesn't have a restriction like that, we really are saying 4K keys, which is why you'll see them being the predominant key length. The other thing to point out about the maintainers is some of the downtrend in the um, 1K keys here is because maintainers become developers, and that's a straightforward transition of key, and we haven't necessarily been enforcing a key change at that point. Phil. I can repeat the question. Shouldn't that be like a flaw and also the subkeys? Because the subkeys are used for signing packages. So, sorry, shouldn't that be a... F 
So, so, so Phil, Phil's point is that we're only looking at the um, key length of the, the primary key um, on, on the key, and it could be that the sub-keys are either a longer or shorter length. Um, longer doesn't really help because you're still limited by the, the primary key, but if the, the sub-keys are shorter length, then that could mean that they are weaker than they seem. I think in general, the in general what I've seen is that sub-keys are usually longer, if anything, <coughs> but usually the same size. Well, and this is the, the graph that worries us most. Uh, although we, we have a converging uh, trend here, this is uh, for the developers. And here it looks we're heading in the right uh, direction. You can very well see the places where we've uh, sent uh, mail, sent posts and uh, things to the, uh, people to really update. And you probably can't see the scale of the five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a second yeah. mic? Do, do we have a second mic? <coughs> but maybe we can just. Okay. One thing you can do is uh, cross reference the yellow line with people that are here at DevConf. So, 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 so the point is, we could cross reference the line with the number of people here at DevConf. And I, I have. I have a list of all 517 short keys, and I need to talk to the organizer to try and get a dump of the um, people here. There's no easy way to do that at the moment. Um, Steve, you were next. Uh, wait. Until I saw that number, my question was going to be, why haven't we just dropped these people already? They've been told a dozen times already. Yes. So, so we have al already. Uh, so, so we've already started looking at that. Um, of the 517 keys that are short, 253 of these people are already known to MIA. Um, so, so yeah, there is an issue there about what's going on, and we have already started having discussions with both DSA and MIA about what we do with these people. Um, and, and we will eventually sure. get to the point that we drop them. Okay. Please name and shame. If you know someone on that list, this list, go and slap them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah part of the thing is we didn't want to to push this too, uh, too much earlier because well. Uh, you can see we, we started like uh, really caring about this around two, uh, 2010, and the the that would have meant either a trem well both a tremendous uh, amount of work to, uh, for us that's coming, we know it's coming, but also that we would end up locking for, uh, three fourths of Debian out of, of the project. Nowadays, we're we're only going to lock one half of the project away. Yeah. Half of them are MIA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, our estimation is that most of them are not active currently. I should clarify the MIA figures. It doesn't mean they're actually MIA. It just means that they are known to the MIA database. They are in discussions with them. So it could be people who are just not completely active or haven't been seen rather than people who are truly missing. Um, so, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they really are people we should drop from the project. And one of the things we've been very careful about as Key Ring Mint is we don't want to kick people out who actually still have an interest in being involved in Debian. Um, we, we don't want to force people out of the project. And, and that's the line we've taken so far, and it's come to the point that we are actually going to have to drop people. But we, we've given this length of time because we really did want people to have an opportunity to get it sorted, enough time to come to a DebCon for another local event and get a key cross signed. And, and we felt that we've bent over backwards and made quite a few meals about get this done, and, and now comes the time that we really do need to sort of say, take a harder line on it. Yep. Uh, well, we, we will now show, uh, until now we have stated, stated facts. Uh, I will also continue, oh, please, Enrico. Um, once the obvious ones like MIA and so on have been taken away, uh, then I think we enter the domain of people who are not necessarily paying a lot of attention to Debian Devil Announce, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be glad to send a round of emails to those people uh, with damn hat saying hi. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what what we're going to present now is uh, well uh, w where we uh, how we want to go forward with this, and also well uh, some bits of the problems we uh, we've had right. So, uh, yeah, we're, oh, I didn't update this, sorry. Uh, well, anyway, it's more or less the, the same. Uh, oh, yeah, right, I did update it. Uh, so, uh, we finally were talking about uh, setting up a cut update, 
yeah, uh, after the end of the year, after uh, the last day of the end of this year, we will just disable all uh, 1K keys because, well, I think there's an agreement that we, we, we can and we should do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's... <laughs> So, so, so that's a good response, because what we're considering doing in terms of this is we'll send a mail to DDA, uh, which everyone will ignore, because I think anyone who's, anyone who's paying attention has hopefully um, already made the switch. But I know for a fact that there are at least three people here at this conference who have not made the switch. So even people who are paying attention to DDA and turning up to events have not done this. We, uh, Stand up. <laughs> Point them out. I, I, I will name them once I have got a definitive list and, and have emailed them once. Um, I, 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 no. <laughs> you can take the Debian key ring and do exactly what I did, which is dump it, look for the 1024 keys. It's, it's not hard to do. Um, we will mail all of them individually as well and send them a mail going, by the way, this is going to happen. Um, so, so we are going to send those mails out, but we did want to run it by people first as going, this is what we're going to do. So let me also say that so this, the bottom point here is kind of critical, right? So there are, th there are three different kinds of developers that we can imagine in this situation, right? Which are people who are, um, who are I'm sorry, this is that, this is, there's a different set. Of, okay, there's three types. There's people who are ignoring. People out of Debian who are interested in maintaining the infrastructure that they need to keep Debian uh, secure. Just, uh, yeah, one, one thing about this is, well, there are many special cases. We are reaching the point where, well, we will find a way to somehow kick those, uh, those cases. Uh, something that was quite a, a strange to, uh, to understand how is that uh, well, we, we, when Aníbal sent the call for keys for the key signing uh, at the, the conf, we got like 12 uh, 1K keys that, well, they were kicked out of the key signing party. Uh, they will not take part of this. Uh, well, wh one of the uh, maybe it's uh, yeah, w one of the things that uh, uh, may be uh, difficult sometimes is that uh, there are many people who are not socially involved in Debian, so those are the faces we don't know. Uh, those people, well, uh, they have a hard time. Maybe they don't. They they care about their their particular itch, but they, they do not care about uh, being a member of a, a socially a member of the project, meeting people and all that. So uh, getting their keys signed is also n uh, difficult well for many reasons yeah, not, not only because they are uh, far away but maybe because they don't feel uh, uh, like at home socially with the rest of us i don't know thing is up to now uh, a very good thing is that i well f i feel the we have as a project honored this uh, uh, to meet a person before signing their key, their keys uh, a lot of people around the world and being nice to people that have been part thus far of the Debian project. So on one hand, I like, I like to de-emphasize the fact that we are not kicking out people of the project. So technically, we're, you or you will acting on the keying will make them unable to do specific kind of participation in Debian. But I'm pretty sure that them, when those people get a new key in the keying, will not have them go through NM again. So it's not like we are kicking people out of the project. We are putting in place technical means that sacrifice their current ability to participate favoring the security of a lot of people around the world. So this is one first comment I wanted to make. And the second one is that we are very much likely in a 80-20 situation in which I think 80% of the cases we are going to deal with are people that are not paying attention. And maybe 20% or maybe 5% are the people with specific condition you have mentioned. So I think you should put in place a process that takes care of the 80% of the people, like mailing them now. They've had four years to migrate and saying, okay, if you have a special case that need our attention, let us know in one month, otherwise in two months we will just disable your key. And for the special cases, well, I think that's very important, so we might even consider asking funds to fly people to them and sign their key in person instead of creating precedents for, you know, signing keys without 
being I, 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 I did at one point make a joking suggestion to a DPL, I can't remember exactly who it was, that Gunnar and I should get to fly around the world and, <laughs> and personally verify every single DD's key, but uh, for some reason that didn't get accepted. Um, the, the, the other thing we have, have considered is um, th there are various other webs of trust that we can tie into. I know that kernel.org have got fairly strict about getting their keys cross-signed, so we can potentially piggyback on some of those for developers who are geographically remote from other DDs but are actually close to other free software developers and we can get trust passed to them. So, so some of that we will consider and I think that ultimately it comes down to case by case basis for that 20% and we will happily talk to anyone and, and I hope this doesn't apply to anyone in the room. Uh, it, it's for people who are watching on the streams or people reporting this afterwards. Um, anyone at DevConf has no excuse for not having a, a larger key signed by two DDs. Um, at least. And, and the other thing also to remember is sign keys with your new key. It's a web of trust that needs to link both ways, so don't just get signatures on your new key, but make sure you have signed people, because I think we are actually strengthening the Debian web of trust through this process. Can we bring those people to DebConf instead of flying the DPL or you guys to wherever they are? Well, we have this uh, DevConf Newbies initiative that uh, part of the uh, uh, air for return uh, refund uh, we do are, uh, are usually meant for uh, people who have not yet come to DevConf. That's one way to reach out to them. Uh, but yes, I have talked with, with some people who say, well, no, that's not, it's not my interest to go to DevConf. The reason I say this is then they can get more signatures on their keys by a larger variety of people. The other potential has been for um, local groups to cross-sign each other and then get one or a couple of those members to then come and visit somewhere else and get it signed. So you can actually do that much more efficiently as long as you have a concentration of developers somewhere that, that makes sense. Um, to jump on what Zach said, do you know if FTP Master is intending to actually block uploads from these keys? Because the security is the concern and they would be concerned of getting uploads from untrusted keys. Right. So maybe one way to enforce that would be to disallow uploads but don't, not dropping the keys from the key ring. Yeah, yeah. So, so the problem would be that the way that um, if the, the reason we run several different key rings and maintain them separately ourselves is because the various users of those key rings determine what to do with the key by which key ring they're in. Um, one potential option if we want to keep people uploading uh, without having them be able to upload anything, which is the major issue, is that we downgrade their key to a Debian maintainer key, which would mean that they're tied very much to only uploading their own package, so they're not disenfranchised in that way, but we lose the security thing. But really at this point, no, um, I, I don't think that's worthwhile. Unle very special case, we will potentially consider that, but it would have to be incredibly special to say that that's the thing, because then you've still got a weakness there. It's just you've limited it to one package. If we get down to a point where we have a smallish number of people left who, for whatever reasons, can't travel, haven't travelled, whatever, um, definitely please, if you, don't necessarily name and shame, I know I suggested that earlier, tongue in cheek, um, if we can find out geographical areas and, and, and post a list somewhere, there are a lot of us who travel anyway as part of our work. In the last year alone, I've met up with probably a dozen people outside of the UK and I've signed, including people in the Bay Area who managed to not meet all the Debian people. <laughs> that scared me. Um, you know, we, it, it's not easy necessarily. There are going to be some people who might live a thousand miles down a beaten track and, and, and we will never get to see them. But it, we, we, we must be able to solve this. Well, one of the, I don't know, eternal uh, huge places uh, uh, that com comes to mind that uh, many people there have had problems is Canada. Uh, the, there's a very large amount of Canadians who are far away from anything and uh, they, well... <laughs> Uh, so, when you were talking about possible trust paths with other organizations, I just wanted to mention that for the GNU project, we're also evaluating our current signing <coughs> policies and keyring policies for FTP upload, where a lot of the GNU upstream packages live. So, we've been looking at the Debian policies and trying to see if maybe if maybe this could help with some of the, you know, if we could link those communities together, possibly more signatures could happen that way too. It would surely help, I think. Um.
Um, so uh, yeah, when it's about um, people who have issues uh, meeting other people to get signatures, it goes back to the known problem of verifying them in the first place, which is something we at Front Desk already struggle with and have several ways, including sometimes mailing private. So I don't think that is an issue. Uh, that's just an, uh, something we already do. Um, it, and I'd be happy if people get in touch uh, happy to help. Uh, the, the 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 issue is probably what do we do with people that don't get in touch, and uh, which I would think Mia is kind of the point. I, I think the problem here has been that there are still lots and lots of keys that need dealt with. Well, whenever we did the V3 migration or, or getting rid of them, quite a few of them had two keys in the key ring. They had one V3 and one V4. It was easy enough to remove. Quite a lot of them were people who'd been in the project for a very long time were actually quite well connected and can get a new key or already had a new key. So it wasn't... The, 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 the short tail at the end of, of people who needed chase was quite small. And at this point we're aware that if we just sort of dumped 500 people on DAM or MIA or, or whatever it is, that, that that's quite a lot. So we are going to do an initial round of meals and try and get the, the easy ones done and, and kick people into actually reacting. And then certainly we will engage with any team who wants to c come and chase those people. Um, and, and, and I'm all for the actually producing a list of people who need to move their keys. It's not a naming and shaming, but it's about people who know them maybe being able to kick them into action if they somehow missed a meal or realizing that they know someone who needs a key signed and they can go and offer and say, I'll sign your key, get off your arse and do it. Um, so this, this hasn't been said clearly, and so I, need, I feel the need to say it. Um, this keying things is because one compromised key will have a huge impact mm -hmm. on the whole world. I'd like to you know, sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just please move that forward. We are living in a post northern world. I mean, if if people part of the project can underst can't understand that they are they have at hands the responsibility of thousands of, of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, then I mean, sorry, uh, read again the, the social contract. Priorities, users, and uh, uh, and so so that's that's one. One, one, one thing. The other thing is that it's there is the so there is the security of the uh, individual keys and you know how developers manage the key and this is a complicated topic and I one thing I would very much love to see. Ah, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I I I mean I, I was. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Please do. I, I would love to see the the keying maintainer uh, put up a best practices document and maybe I would love to see the project funds smart cards for any developer who want one right yeah well uh, thank you for this I, I completely agree with, with what you say and I was well uh, I was telling them well may, we should right now interrupt for a little the discussion we have just uh, one more point here in, uh, in the queue of things to say one point that will probably uh, bog more of you because uh, we, we don't do it I, I must say, well, my own keys, I, I don't think they're properly handled and uh, I should be among the first to change this. So we've been talking, for example, how can we improve the key handling practices? Well, for example, uh, separating the, the, the main key from the signing keys, requiring keys to expire. And technically, we can uh, 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 easily add the checks to see if all of the keys we have uh, are, uh, I mean, we got uh, an expire, uh, expirable uh, or... Ex can, can I just justify that yep, for a second? Please. So some people are probably horrified by seeing a recommendation or even a re possible requirement of key expiration. And so I wanted to just explain why this is potentially a reasonable thing. Um, I know that many people don't um, have an expiration date set on their keys and they have a revocation certificate that they have offline someplace so that if they lose their key or their key gets compromised they can just publish the revocation certificate and be done with it. Um, in that case those people probably there is no good reason to argue that they need uh, an expiration date. Um, but we can't know from the outside whether you actually are maintaining your revocation certificate properly um, and we would like the key we would like to know that you are trying to maintain your key um, and if you have an expiration date set on your key, it turns out that you can update the expiration date. So if you update it every couple of years, 
and move the expiration date out, you will have an expiration date on your key. And by updating the expiration date, you're, ev you're proving that you still have your key at the very least. You can, even update it after it expires. you can also even update it after it expires. So, yeah. So, so just it, it's worth it's worth being aware that that you can do this and that you should maintain your keys and that you can actually add new self sigs on your keys as you as you as you, your key handling practices change. You can add new sub keys and so forth. Um, and so, setting a key expiration publicly is a way of ensuring that people get a copy of your new updates from the key servers because otherwise they'll say, oh, this key is expired, let me refresh it. Um, and then they'll get whatever updates you've updated. So expirations have other advantages beyond um, like your key suddenly disappearing. Um, if, if the use case you have in mind is uh, just see that the person still controls the key, uh, that could just as well be done by seeing that they've used the key. Uh, like sign something uh, recently, uh, or uh, would that be okay also to just have expiration dates on subkeys? So B because I would still. But you're missing the you're missing the last use case that I mentioned, which okay. is that people probably will update their keys if they're maintaining them, and they may update by signaling that they prefer different cipher suites. They may update in other ways. The only way to get people to notice that is to make sure that they refresh their keys right. from the key servers. So uh, expiration dates on subkeys would still fit that requirement. So after two years, my subkeys have expired. Somebody needs to re-download my key to see that there's subkey material yes, that that's is true. usable. Yes, that's true. Might, uh, having, might having expiration dates on the master keys help mitigate the 1024 problem? Uh, probably not, because your master key would still have been one, 124. I, I mean, these people who might be potentially MIA, right, the right. keys would have just faded out. So, so the keys wouldn't have faded out. What you could potentially use it for is a way of saying, this key is obviously not an active use and then potentially flagging that to the MIA team as a, this key has been expired for a period of time and therefore might need to be looked at. If it's been expired, Right, but the, so the point is that actually if it's been expired, yeah. if it's been expired, um, then the FTP won't accept signatures from it. And that's actually probably a good thing if the key is actually I idle and it's a weak key. And so there may be other changes that we want in the future, right? We've talked about V3 to V4. We've talked about 1024-bit to larger than 2048-bit. There may be other changes that we want to push in the future, and requiring an expiry gives us a, at least a window that we can say, okay, you know, when, when the next change comes down the line, potentially elliptic curve crypto, um, I'm, I'm not requiring this now. I'm just like putting it out there that there are other possible changes that we'll, we will be pushing for. Having ex expiration dates on all the keys in the key ring will make sure that we have a window in which we can actually do that kind of transition that everyone knows about and has seen from the beginning. Just wanted to point out there is a utility that you can install. It's in Debian, written by someone who's here at DevConf, that will keep your key ring updated. Uh, over time by slowly refreshing all the keys over Tor so you are not exposing your uh, social graph uh, called parsimony and it will run in the background just keep, keep everything updated for you I recommend checking that out although I believe there's a there's like someone rewrote parsimony and it's better somehow I forget exactly how but like it's it's on github so there, there may be two versions. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a. It's written in Bash. I'd just like to point out that uh, education and documentation could help here. Uh, when I was doing signatures recently, it wasn't clear to me what a signature meant, what it meant for a subkey what it meant to change a, um, a parameter on a key in terms of signatures, and all that kind of gets in the way of going forward on this. If it was clearer what exactly it means when you do a signature and what you can and can't do after you've signed a key without invi invalidating either all or part of that signature, and what does it mean to have a sub key 
and what does it mean to have a signature on the master versus the subkey, all that stuff is really not covering the documentation as well as it could be. And if it was, it would be easier for a person to sit down, read the documents, and understand what to do next. Well, I, I agree the documentation is very important, but uh, on the other hand, I mean, uh, there's so much documentation about uh, crypto handling. I don't think we, we have to rewrite or even mirror all of the available documentation. I, I mean, you are right. Uh, maybe we should try at least to link to, to explanations. Uh, we have tried, for example, uh, to, 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 uh, to show the process. Uh, uh, one that comes to mind is uh, when Anna wrote uh, the, uh, her uh, uh, instructions on how to generate a proper key. Well, we just copied over because it, it was very well done and it was meant for our use. Uh, but uh, there's so many things that we can do about what it means to split a, a key between the sub keys and how to do that. that, 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 that. It, it gets too, too much in the details and all the. I, I, I challenge you to look at to see what it means to sign a key and what you can do to change it without invalidating the key. It seems very straightforward, and I couldn't find a way to do it without getting into the source code. Sir, I, I would be happy to try to work with people who want to do that kind of documentation. Um, I worry that I've um, internalized too much of RFC 4880 to be able to write in English anymore. I'm but if someone wants about what the scope is for the signature, just when you sign something, this is what it means. And sure. This is what it's and what I'm against. saying is anyone who wants to work on something like that, who wants to run it by someone who knows the, the, the gruesome technical details to make sure that the documentation is both accessible to someone who is trying to get something concrete done and is not technically incorrect, I would be happy to collaborate with that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I will be able, the, the one to be able to write the, the specific accessible stuff, but anyone who wants to come find me, I'm DKG, um, I will be happy to work with you on it. Yeah, I think if, if anyone does want to work on such documentation, then they can quite happily run it by keyring me into debian.org. Um, and, and I think if we got something that was a how-to, we would happily put it up on keyring.debian.org for people to be uh, able to go and view. But we're, we're not the right people to write the accessible documentation because we've been doing this for years and some of it is second nature and we won't think of the right questions. Um, but, but to help someone who sort of wants to bridge that gap, absolutely. And let me also say that one of the problems is that Debian developers in their crypto handling process and in their packaging process and everything are a remarkably diverse group, I suspect. <laughs> um, and so if we say here is, here is the way to do it, we're going to get pushback and from people who say, well, that's not how I do it. I do it better because it's better like this. And it may well be better for them. So that, this kind of documentation would be great to have to say, here are you know, three styles. There's the, you know, and we can pick them out and work on, on something like that and, and have something nice and concise that explains the advantages and the comparisons between the different styles. I think that would be useful. But it's still not one thing. Um. Mike? Uh, I would just say that um, uh, on that point, uh, one of the things that we've done in the Python team is we've said, you know, we have a strong opinion about how things are, even though there's lots of options. And we have um, sort of the, the main path down the documentation is, here's how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we can have links, you know, that say, well, there's, you know, there are alternatives. Go look over here if you're really interested in that. But, but having, I think having a strong opinionated way, which is sort of, largely maybe your consensus best practices is, is really helpful to people because a lot of people don't want choice. They want to know what is the right way to do it. And yes, there's a lot of options, but. So I want to highlight that there's a tool um, that's called, uh, I think it's, uh, it's in uh, Hopin PGP dash tools package that's called, uh, that it's, it's a Haskell implementation. Um, thank you, Clint Adams. Um, but it's, it's uh, Hokey lint, and you can run it on your key, and it will give you a list of suggestions about what you can do to improve the situation of your key itself. So I recommend checking that out. No Valve games for users of 1024-bit keys. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an incentive for some of us. Are we done with the slides? Did yeah. you get to everything? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Could you say briefly something about the future of OpenPGP open itself? Uh, I can try. Yeah. Well, you you were trying to get it to update. And um, so uh, 
there's two questions. Th there's two questions here. One is the future of OpenPGP, and one is the future of GPG um, in Debian. And so I'll, I'll I'll talk about OpenPGP. OpenPGP is moving um, at a glacial pace towards elliptic curve cryptography, which is not widely implemented. Um, but I don't know if folks have seen. Uh, Google has produced a uh, not yet distributed alpha version uh, webmail plugin for Chrome. Uh, called end-to-end -end encryption that generates new keys that are elliptic curve keys. Um, uh, GNU PG's 2.1 beta has elliptic curve crypto in it. Um, so there's a, there's a push towards their much smaller keys that are that uh, per strength. So for for something comparably strong, the keys the keys and the signatures are much shorter. Um, it's a different kind of crypto, and it will be. Um, hopefully available in experimental, possibly by the end of DebConf. Um, so this ties into the evolution of GPG. Um, so if folks are interested in experimenting with newer versions and newer newer crypto, um, uh, either come to the GNU PG Mate session or uh, come find some of us afterwards and watch experimental. Um, it's worth pointing out that this ties somewhat into Wookie's talk from the other day and that even if we get elliptic curve crypto in not Jesse but whatever comes next, um, until that release becomes stable and is deployed throughout the Debian infrastructure, we will have no way to accept those keys as part of Debian because nothing will be able to verify them. Um, so it will be some time before we can accept elliptic curves as part of, uh, of the Debian keyring, um, which is kind of unfortunate. I have a moderately related question about uh, strength, which is that it's uh, apparently the case that fingerprints are always SHA-1. And I was wondering if there are standard practices to get away from using SHA-1 here. So, so there is some move towards an open PGP v5 format, which will standardize on a separate hash. And I think it's SHA-256 or SHA-512. There's no decision yet. I mean, one of the things about the changes from V3 to V4 was V3 was using MD5 sums over a different set of the key material, which is part of the problem, and, and V4 moved to SHA-1, but that's going to require a, a, um, an incompatible change in the actual PGP uh, format. So, yeah, you don't have to use SHA-1. You could use MD5 by using v the V3 keys. Yeah, no, you don't do that. That is not a serious suggestion. This is actually the way that you forge a fingerprint in OpenPGB V3 fing fingerprint. The, the fingerprint is actually done by um, an MD5 of the modulus. So RSA is a modulus and an exponent, and it's, a, it's MD5 over the concatenation of the modulus and the exponent. So the way that you forge the fingerprint is you just cut up the bit string in a different place, and you find a new M, a new modulus M and a new exponent E, and you just look for that until you find a factorable M prime, and now you've got a, thing, a key that has the exact same fingerprint. Um, so that's been fixed in V4 keys as of 20 years ago, 12 years ago, I don't know, a long time ago. Um, um, but but I wanted to talk about why, so we can move away from that. That's, that's, the, that's, that's a cryptographic problem, but the, SHA-1 for fingerprints is not, I don't believe that that is directly attackable right now. So SHA-1 is attackable um, for collisions. No one has published an SHA-1 collision, but actually OpenPGP v4 fingerprints are not a situation where we're worried about the collision resistance of the hash, we're worried about pre-image resistance. And pre-image pre resistance is significantly stronger than collision resistance. So yes, we are moving away from SHA-1, but for the fingerprints themselves, that's actually not that important. Um, so another kind of related question is, um, I guess inline PGP is like not cool anymore. And we use it all over a lot of our infrastructure. In fact, even keyring.debian.org, when I looked at the process for updating keys, it says, don't use PGP MIME because it breaks it. Please, please fix request tracker. Yeah. Yeah. Please fix request tracker not to mangle PGP MIME and not to decide to re-encode mails and not to do all manner of things. Absolutely, PGP MIME mails is the right way to do things as far as we're concerned. but. Um, we're limited by the infrastructure we have. Um, RT will actually do signature verification for you, but for hopefully fairly obvious reasons, we want to do the verification ourselves rather than trust some random piece of infrastructure. Yeah, well, uh, even sometimes it's 
quite uh, bothering and they, we, we, we have encoding issues when, uh, when we have some keys correctly sent to RT, inline signed, uh, but somebody used, I don't know, the wrong char set or whatever and we can spend hours looking for what what's wrong. I, I actually know what goes on here. What, what actually goes on is that the likes of Mutt will choose the best character set it can find to try and represent your mail as seven or eight bits. So rather than encoding as Unicode, it'll, for example, use Latin 1. And, and RT, in its wisdom, decides that it's going to re-encode everything into UTF-8, which is fine, but then it sends out the mail in UTF-8, so your mail has been re-encoded from Latin 1 to UTF-8 and therefore doesn't validate when we receive it anymore. Um, line wrapping also happens. There's a whole bunch of things that mangle mail that then mean that you can't validate the, car the, the, the signature, and I've got uh, quite adept at trying to figure out what they are and fixing it up so that they validate without having to go and bother developers again. Um, but yeah... Uh, but fix RT. Yes, who's it for all that? It's not just RT, it's also our archive software generates tons of... The archive is um, generating signed mails which are pretty much the changes file. Rather than it, I mean, you'd have to basically take the changes file that's been uploaded. What you've done is you've uploaded a clear signed file. You'd have to take that apart, turn it into a PGP MIME thing, and I think that's a bit more understandable. Um, I, I think that we should all be able to send PGP MIME meals and have them just work. And, and I will accept that the Keyring Mint team are the worst example of people who can't just accept PGP MIME meals. But we don't have the time to go and fix RT, and we're very grateful for DSA for running the RT instant for us, and we don't expect them to go and fix it, so, uh, yeah, please send patches. I just wanted to add something to respond to the question about uh, the future of GNU PG. Uh, I know that the project itself is moving pretty slow at times, and Part of the reason for that is the developers are having a difficult time sustaining the, the development, and so they're they're looking for help, uh, not just actual help, but um, uh, funding to keep it going. So if you happen to be a large company with lots of money to throw around, I know they're looking for some. <laughs> uh, it might help move things a little faster. I don't know, but uh, I think GNU PG needs a lot of uh, labor help to move things quicker. Also on that subject, there's a GPG-1 and a GPG-2, and I don't actually know anything about what the difference is or which one I should use, and then there's also like a GPG-V and a GPG-ME and it's kind of something else. For someone who doesn't actually care and just wants to sign things and just wants to verify things, what should I be using? Is there a canonical, just use this answer? Uh, well, GPG is going to be on your Debian system no matter what, so you can just use that. But this is the wrong talk for that. Okay. Um, this is keyring maint, not GNU PG maint. And GNU PG maint will actually have a talk, I believe it's tomorrow, and please come, we'll talk about the details. There, there, we're hope. There's been a lot of discussion about what we can do to improve that situation, okay. um, but that would be the place to talk about it. Short term, just use the GPG. You've already got it. It's there. It works. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. There's a key signing um, event. Uh, what's yeah, at, three, at, three, 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 two thirty to three fifteen, and I believe it will be in this room. Correct? Yeah. Yes. It'll be in this room. So come to that. Get your keys signed. All right, you're out one minute early.